Okay, now we come to the, the most interesting one of the bunch called capital budgeting. Anytime you get into a business, eventually you're going to get to the point where you're going to be buying plant property equipment. And you're going to have uh, things that you're going to buy that are going to last a long time. You're going to buy a truck. You're going to build a building. You're going to, you know, any sort of pieces of equipment. So what we want to do is to build up your skills so that you can actually effectively evaluate these. And this is where this capital budgeting stuff is all about. Now, as you saw in the textbook, we show you that there's these real simple things that do not require this time value of money. And I'll let the book talk about that, which is nothing more than opportunity cost. And we said way back when, you want to be the first choice of your investors. Well, if your industry is earning 10%, you better be investing in projects that are at least paying 10%, if not more, because if you're investing in projects with below 10, there's no reason for anybody to invest in your firm. These are techniques that will allow you to do that. So we're going to start with the simple things of compounding and discounting, and then we'll move down to the more complicated stuff. They're all explained in the book, but we thought if we did some of these step-by-steps, that you'd these smaller steps, that you'd be able to figure out what's going on. So here we go. Your grandparents have started a college fund for you with $10,000 in a savings account that pays 5% per year. If they don't put any more money into that account, how much money you'll have when you're 18 years old? Since we're going out to the future, we're talking about compounding. So compounding is going from now into the future. And this is where we have our terms. Here's our general equation. And VN is my notion, same as the book value now. Future value, N is the number of periods, and I would be the interest rate. This is our standard formula. Now, believe it or not, there are actually these compound values are in the back of the book in Appendix 1. Several students have indicated they were shocked. They didn't know there were such things back there. There are. If you have a fancy calculator, please feel free to use it. We're going to limit ourselves to the four digits that are in the back of the book. So it's a matter of value now is how much we're putting in. There's our 10 grand. We then take 1.05, the interest rate, times the number of periods, which is 18. You can either calculate on your calculator or you can look it up in the back. So every dollar goes from a dollar to two dollars and 44.66. So our $10,000 will grow into $24,066 after 18 years. Real simple. Very straightforward. Now, that's the one that we're most uh, familiar with. We have to look at it also the other way is we want to go with a thing called discounting. It's if we need so much money down the road, how much money do we need to put into our savings account today? And all we've really done is taken that equation and shuffled the parts. If you look back up to number one, instead of solving for the future value, now we're going to solve for the value today. Let's take a look at another example. If your grandparents want to lock in the uh, tuition at twenty thousand today, so they'll have twenty when you when you get to that age. How much money do they need to put in the account today so that you'll have twenty thousand dollars when it's eighteen? And we'll once again assume the savings account pays you five percent. Now, if you look at this, we see the exact same numbers we did in the problem above. We've just reshuffled them, and I'll box that off. So now we take the 20,000 divided by 2.4066. Now we need to do is to put $8,310.48 in the bank today. And 18 years from now at 5% through the miracle of compound interest, we will have 20,000. These numbers are also found in the back of the book in appendix table two. Third concept, thing called annuity. Congratulations, you've just won the lottery for 100 million bucks. You can either take the payoff in a $100 million lump sum payment, or you can receive $5 million per year for the next 20 years. Which is best? Which has the highest present value? Again, let's assume the interest rate is 5%. Well, let's talk about what the, I have a new term. The annuity is a series of equalized payments or receipts. Best examples are car loans, student loans, mortgages, um, leases, all sorts of stuff. So anytime you see the same amount of money coming or going for many periods, the word is annuity. 
These are also found at the back of the book in Table 3. So what we can do is uh, we want to take the, uh, we want to find out how much that's worth today if, in fact, we want the present value of that. The value now is the annual payments times this annuity rate. And again, I'll let you look in the book to figure out how all the gory details work. Well, if I'm going to receive a dollar for each of the next 20 years at an annuity at, at a 5% interest rate, that's like getting $12.46.22. We take the $5 million, <clears throat> and uh, as we look down here, the, that's the same as having $62,311,000 today. In other words... If I could put $62,311,000 in the bank today, and if I take out 5% every year for the next 20 years, when the account pays the 5%, it will be emptied out before the account is fully emptied out. So I can put $62 million in the bank today and duplicate this payment scheme and still have $37,689,000 left over to do other stuff. Take the lump sum. Straightforward. Now we want to look at some of the ways we analyze alternatives. The best one of the bunch is this thing called net present value, NPV. This is the technique that allows you to evaluate opportunities. If you get a positive value for net present value, you have a return that exceeds the opportunity cost, the discount rate, the interest rate that you've done. You want to invest in projects that return a positive net present value because it says the projects are returning more than the opportunity cost. You're enhancing the value of the firm. So we take the present value of the inflows, we take the present value of the cash outflows, net the two, if it's above zero, that's good. See if I can do a happy face here like we used to do. And if it's below, at this point in the semester, we used to do this. It's the end of the year. That's the background. Read the book for more details. Let's take a look at our cash flows in this particular example. The present value of the cash flows is how much of a return we are going to get. And this thing had stretched out for 10 years at 8%. The present value of these particular cash flows is $25,000 a year times this annuity rate. Those cash flows are worth $167,752.50. To do this, we have to pay $200,000. So, in fact, if we take this project on, the value of the company will be decreased by $32,000. $247.50. Therefore, we want to reject the project. We reject it because the negative net present value says we are not making the 8% opportunity cost that we had to to make this something that would enhance. So if we make more than 8%, we're adding to the value of the firm and therefore a higher stock price. If it's less than 8%, we are actually consuming capital, and the value of the company will decline. That's why when you look at Wall Street reports, when they talk about somebody getting involved in some big project, the price of the stock goes up or down. It's this assessment of what the future earnings and costs are going to be. Net present value, the best way to do this. Net present value is widely used in the corporate world, private world, in the public sector. They don't like to talk about profits and losses. They prefer to talk about benefits and costs. So what we've done in the public sector, and a lot of environmental things are done using this benefit-cost ratio, instead of uh, subtracting the uh, outflows from the inflows, as we did above in net present value, now all we want to do is divide them, the present value of the benefits divided by the present value of the cost. Very simple, straightforward, 167752 1,500 divided by 2 gives us 0 
and it says for every dollar we invest, we get back uh, not 84 cents. So it's not a particularly good project to invest in. So when we do it this way, acceptable projects are those that have a benefit. You get back more benefits than the cost. Unacceptable are ones where the benefits are less than the cost of the project. The only thing that I spend time on that doesn't have the time value is the payback method. And I have that reason for two reasons. One, it helps us get to the next one, this internal rate of return. But it also gives us, it's a very popular one that's used by industry. You need to know it's there. And if you look on the text, you can see all the reasons why. We don't think it's, it's a very reliable thing to do. I refer you back to the book for that. Again, a very simple calculation. Using the same stuff that was in question four, it's total investment over total return. If we invest $200,000, we save $25,000 a year. It takes us eight years to recover our investment. And what most firms do is they set some sort of maximum limit. If it doesn't pay for itself in three, four, or five years, it's not an acceptable project. Very popular, be careful, but I use it so we can get to the next one. Well, I guess next to last technique is this thing called the internal rate of return, IRR. The rate of return, people said, you know, in the net present value, I got a positive number, but what kind of a return was I actually earning in the project? This will allow you to figure out pretty much what that rate of return is. And for those of you who come out of the sciences, you expect far more uh, precision. Those of us in the business world are content if we can say it's between 23 and 25 percent or 14 and 16 percent, that's good enough. So to be able to estimate what some of these revenues and costs are going to be 20, 30, or 40 years or more out is really kind of shaky stuff. You just want to make sure that you've got a general idea of where it stands. And we build on this by using the, the idea that when net present value equals zero, when that's the case, the discount rate is the internal rate of return. So for all the things we do, we have very simple problems that allow us to make that calculation using some of the things we've just seen in the problem before this where we did the, uh, the uh, payback method. But the trick of all this is we want the present value of the inflows to equal the present value of the outflows. Let's look at something with the example we have here. We need an investment of 61,446 bucks. This will make us will allow us to make a 10 a $10,000 increase in profits over the next 10 years. What's the appropriate discount rate? And we see that same equation we've used before, annual savings and also the dollar amount. What's interesting is what we don't have is the interest rate, the discount rate, the opportunity cost that we need to apply to this project to make this happen. But we can do that by working our way to it. Let's insert the numbers. Here's the annual savings, 10000 Here's the investment. We divide the, uh, the actual investment by the annual savings. And we find out that the appropriate annuity number is 6.1446. So what? So what we have to do is, again, go to the back of the book. In this case, we're going to work our way to it. And for everything we do, you're going to find the exact number in the back of the book, because I start with that as the answer and work my way backwards. So go to table three, go down the margin to 10, go across the row till you see that number. 6.1446, go up to the top of the column, and lo and behold, the internal rate of return is 10% in this particular project. Down to the last one, and one of the ways is if you want to figure out, there are all these little variations that occur, and I had most of these in school and I picked up a few more along the way. One of the more useful ones that I had many years ago was a thing called equivalent annual cost. And it comes up in a practical session when you have, let's say, two, two types of uh, machines. Uh, one will last for five years. We'll use the one here. One will last for 10 years. Which one is the best one to pick? So what we do is we convert 
the uh, annual cost of the machine to an annual basis. So this gives us a way to put the two machines on a similar platform. So what we're looking for is which option has the lowest cost per year, everything else being the same. Now the, ob the object is to convert that one-time purchase into an annual expense and find the one with the lowest annual cost. In machine one, we know that um, $5,000 was the investment. The annuity was five years at 8%. We then solve for the value now. And paying $5,000 for a machine that lasts five years, this is an annual cost of $1,252.29 per year for machine one. We'd carry out the very same calculation for machine two. Only now we use the 10 years at 8%. And we now find that the second machine cost us $1,043.20. Well, $1,043 cost per year is lower than what we had before for machine run. So it's real simple. I mean, machine two is the best choice because it gives you a lower operating cost per year. So there's a quick look at the capital budgeting ones. And uh, this is one of those things you need to practice these. This, this type of problem will be seen on, on the, it's on the quizzes for capital budgeting and all the others. And it's also, as we said, the quiz questions have been old exam questions in the past. So take a look at these. The beauty of these things is you can run this over and over. If this doesn't work, give me a call. Be happy to help. Good luck.